Welcome. This is the first presentation in the Strategy Consultants Toolkit. Obviously, it's number one. Today, we're going to talk about framing the problem and a solution. And why do we want to start here? Well, let's think about the end goal of our consulting projects. What we want to have is insightful recommendations that will drive business performance. We want to have a dazzling presentation that will impress our clients. And we want to create a relationship that will allow us to have repeat business and continue to help our clients improve their business performance. Well, what lies underneath all of those goes back to the very beginning, and that's the ability to really solve the client's real problem. And that entails being able to frame the problem and think through potential solutions and create a strategy. So let's talk for a minute about what is strategy, just as a reminder. Well, strategy is choosing about where to invest, how to invest, what resources to allocate, including human actions, over some longer period of time in order to create a competitive advantage, which is usually measured as superior performance. So with that in mind, a good strategy problem will have three components. Number one, it'll be about resource allocation. It'll be something about how do we invest, how do we act. Um, it'll be longer term longer than, a, than perhaps a product development cycle. And it will also deal with competitive advantage. The outcome of this problem has to give the firm a decisive advantage in its marketplace with its competitors or among its potential customers. So how to frame a problem properly is four simple steps. Number one, we're going to talk about how to define the problem. Number two, how to develop a set of candidate solutions. Number three, how to articulate a set of hypotheses about those candidate solutions and identify the key assumptions that go with those hypotheses. And number four, in the, in the spirit of the scientific method, we're going to identify the critical test and the data that will be required to help us verify or refute the hypotheses. So let's talk first about defining the problem. Well, First step, and a great place to start in terms of defining client is uh, defining the problem is to ask the client. They typically know what the problem is they're facing and what problem they want solved. The next step is a bit more complicated though, and that's to find out why this is an important problem. Now your client's going to think, well, of course it's important because I just told you. But here are three follow-on questions that you really want to understand. What's the pain that the problem is causing? Is it lost revenue? Is it competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis competitors or new entrants in the marketplace? Or is it a threat to our very business model and existence? Remember, at the end of the day, the client's paying you to make the pain go away, um, not necessarily to solve a particular what they think the problem is. So you need to understand, to get some broader context, what's the pain point and also what's the level of pain? Is it bleeding at the neck or is this a minor scratch? Secondly, you want to understand who's ultimately responsible for this problem. Is it your client? Is it perhaps your client's boss? Is it the board of directors? Well, what you want to try to focus on is solving a problem that's a, a problem that your client has responsibility for. That, that makes for a better solution. It's a whole different thing to advise a, a, an entrepreneur about whether she ought to buy another company than it is to, to uh, advise a middle manager in a large corporation who will have to take your recommendations up to the board or up to the C-suite for approval. Third, how is the organization currently managing this problem? So are they living in denial that it's not really a problem at all? Are they tremendously anxious about the problem where they're doing nothing but wringing their hands? Um, have they tried a few things and failed? Have they hired an intern or dedicated some staff to working on this problem? Um, this isn't so much important for framing the problem, but it really matters later on when we talk about how to present solutions because all problems exist within a context. Problems tend to be organizational and the context tends to be emotional. And so understanding the emotional content of the problem is an important part of effectively framing. So once you've asked those questions, you, you typically want to frame the problem as a question. And the reason you want to frame it as a question is because everything else we're going to talk about is how to find the answer to that question. And remember, a good consulting engagement is about one question. Now, there may be follow-on questions that will be different engagements, but you want to focus on one question. 
Here are some examples. Number one, perhaps which international market should the company enter first? Not which international markets are attractive, but which one should the company enter first? Um, how should the company respond to X, a new competitor in the market? And finally, how can a company ignite growth? Now, this is the example that I'm going to follow on through the rest of our presentation, talking about a potential problem of how might a company ignite growth. Think about developing, the next step is developing candidate solutions. So think big picture first. So think about instead of, well, we could solve the problem by using blue in our packaging instead of pink, or we could have plastic instead of cardboard packaging. Let's talk about big picture. Are we selling to the right customers? How are we making money? Um, what are the long-term market trends? So start big and then let's go small. Um, you want to create a solution set that's mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So each of the elements, each of the potential solutions should be different from any of the other solutions. But when you roll them all up into a whole, you should have all of the potential solutions. So if our problem is how to ignite growth, well, let's start by thinking at the very big picture. Growth could be about, are we ha do we have the right products? And how do we goose our product sales in order to, to grow? Or are we in the right markets? Are we in slow growing or stagnating markets? Or are we in rapidly growing markets? So these two are a great way to frame a growth problem. And notice that they're exclusive, that you can have products that could sell and you can have markets. And both of them are important, but they may be independent. OK, then we'll go to the next level of detail. Well, we could think about selling existing products or we could think about selling new products. Now notice those are mutually exclusive because a product is either currently on the market or not currently on the market. But when you roll them all up, they're collectively exhaustive. So there are only two options for products. Um, same thing for markets. We can sell into existing markets or we can develop new markets. So we've got the, the MISI criteria. And now let's just flesh this out just to finish the example. If we want to sell more existing products to in existing markets, we're talking about how to increase penetration. And in fact, this may, may be strategic or it may be more tactical. If we're talking about selling new products into an existing market, then we're talking about a product development capability within the firm. And that's something that's clearly strategic. Are we allocating resources over the long term to develop products that will give us a competitive advantage. Let's say we want to take our existing products into new markets. That's about market development. And the questions there will come to later. Do we have the right skills and do we have the right abilities to find and identify new profitable markets? Finally, if we want to create new products to sell into new markets, we're going to diversify. And that could either be internal through just a greenfield entry into a new market and a new product space, or that might even be an acquisition. Now notice here this two by two matrix you might have seen in your marketing class. It's the classic ANSOF growth matrix, but it's a nice way of framing potential solutions about how do we grow the company. Okay, next step, develop and articulate a set of hypotheses and core assumptions. A hypothesis, just by way of reminder, is a clear declarative sentence that is either true or false. So in our igniting growth example, let's say our hypothesis is market development is the best strategy for growth. Now notice that phrase is the best, not market development is one of the strategies for growth or a potential strategy. But by saying that it's the best, it will either at the end of our research be the best or it won't be the best. So the hypothesis will be true or the hypothesis will be false. Next, you want to think about what assumptions would have to be true in order for us to believe that the hypothesis is correct? Or in what world is market development the best strategy for growth? So let's look at some potential assumptions. So assumption number one might be, hey, the current product that we're selling actually adds significant value in new market X. Well, OK. That's a great assumption because if we don't create value, it's hard to create a competitive advantage in the new market. Assumption two might be, hey, market X is actually big enough. There's enough demand to make it viable to, to overcome the costs of entry and the costs of operation. 
Number three, number one and two have both been external. Number three might be something internal, that we have sufficient marketing capability to pull this off to actually successfully enter Market X. The beauty of hypotheses and assumptions is what you're out to do then is test the assumptions. Because if any one of those assumptions is false, then the hypothesis is false and you can move on to another potential solution. So the product may have value, the market may be big enough, but the company may not have the what it takes, the moxie, to enter that market successfully. Therefore, market development probably isn't the best strategy for growth. Okay, so the fourth step is develop the critical test. So we know what our assumptions are, and the critical test and our hypotheses and our assumptions, going back to the Astro Teller stuff that we talked about on the first day, what data would prove our hypothesis false? This is what Astro Teller and his Google group are doing. They're trying to, to falsify the hypothesis that whatever work they're working on is actually a good idea. They're trying to prove it's a bad idea. And that's better than trying to prove it's a good idea because, again, it's, it's easier to find data that will support your hypothesis than it is to find data that will reject it. And it's far more comforting to find confirming evidence. So once we get the critical test, then we're going to go out and do qualitative research or quantitative research, and we're going to actually find the data and compare the data to our assumption and see if we can make a judgment of whether it's true or false. So for example, ex assumption number one, the product adds significant value in the new market. Well, it might be a critical test is let's review competitors' offerings in the market and see how different our product is from theirs. We may in fact go out and do that and find that there are two very similar products to our own, so the value added might be marginal but not significant. Assumption number two, sufficient demand exists to grow X in X market. Well, the total available market might turn out to be big enough, but the serviceable obtainable market, or SOM, might be too small to justify the cost of entry. So we have to think carefully about how we slice up the market and how we think about, is the market big enough? In terms of assumption number three, well, does the company have sufficient marketing capability? Well, it might cost Y in terms of number of salespeople, advertising dollars, or um, you know, sort of sustained PR capability to enter the market, and the firm may lack those capabilities or may lack those resources. Similarly, what if the firm is really lousy at branding and doesn't have a really well-established brand? That would call into question whether they've really got the internal capability to move into the, to the new market. So the function of the critical test is to figure out are the assumptions that underlie our hypothesis true and if they're not true, then let's reject the hypothesis and move on to another solution. Okay, in summary, really quickly, framing the problem is the key to adding real value for the client. If you want to dazzle your client at the end, you've got to identify the right problem at the beginning. Um, defining the right problem enables you as a consultant to see both the problem and the context that the problem exists in. Now, your client often sees the problem but they don't see the context. That's the water that they swim in, and that's one of the areas where you add value. Third, creating a mutually ex exclusive, collectively exhaustive set of potential solutions makes your solution set and makes your research rigorous and thorough. So at the end of the day, you can present with confidence to your client that you actually have found what might be the best or the optimal strategy given the, the different options that they have. Um, Defining hypotheses and assumptions gives you a way to know whether you're right or wrong. Now, there will be judgment involved whether 28% market share is significant or 35% is significant, but at least you're in the, you've got a framework to think about what are the evaluation criteria that you're going to use. And finally, the beauty of the critical test part of, the, of this analysis is that it determines what your research strategy is. Once you know what the critical test is and the critical data, then you know all we got to do is go find that data, either qualitatively through interviews or quantitatively by uh, scouring the internet or by doing other types of research. Okay, 